I'm Vicki Hogarth and welcome to Southwest Magazine. On today's episode, we'll be taking a closer look at how to better care for our most vulnerable citizens, particularly during the difficult times of COVID-19. I'll be speaking with Lori Nichol, CEO of Canada's largest food rescue organization, Second Harvest. Second Harvest has rescued surplus food from generous businesses across Canada for over 30 years, diverting it from landfills to bring it to the tables of those most in need. Second Harvest is currently expanding its foodrescue.ca program to reach more people and communities in need across Canada during COVID-19. But first, I'm sitting down with New Brunswick Green Party leader David Kuhn to discuss how New Brunswick, in the face of COVID-19, can improve how nursing homes are run for both residents and workers. We will also be talking about food sustainability in the province and the need for a year-round ferry to Campobello to link islanders to the rest of the province. Thank you for joining me today, Mr. Kuhn. My pleasure. Can we start off by talking about what you think wages and working conditions should be for long-term caregivers, particularly in nursing homes? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's two things. It's the wages and it's working conditions. So the wages, uh, you know, the, the contract, uh, the last contract ran out in 2016. So it's been four years um, for nursing home workers, the caregivers in nursing homes working without a contract. And certainly over those four years, inflation has eaten up a lot of, uh, you know, what the, of their earning power, their buying power. So um, there needs to be uh, clearly a fair wage paid to reflect that and to reflect the uh, increased workload that, uh, that nursing homes have been seeing. Um, and that's before we got into COVID. Now, of course, with the pandemic, the workload has gone up significantly as uh, there are no longer family members and volunteers helping to share the workload. So it is uh, all uh, on the, uh, the caregivers in the nursing homes. Um, and they have, of course, the added stress and anxiety of, of operating on the front lines in a pandemic. Obviously, there's a shortage issue when it comes to workers as well. Do you think a pay increase would drop people back into the field or to the field? Well, uh, I've been saying for a long time that one of the keys to retaining people in the field and recruiting people into uh, care work in our nursing homes is that there is a decent uh, wage and benefits uh, so that people can see it as a real career. Uh, that, uh, that they could take on. Uh, now, currently, as I proposed uh, weeks ago now to the Premier, uh, it makes sense quite outside of those, those the contract negotiations, because I don't think, I can't imagine too much is happening on that front right now in the middle of the pandemic, that um, it would be fair and a, a good idea to pay a, a top-up um, um, sort of bonus, I guess, right now to recognize the uh, extra workload uh, and the, the difficult situation uh, working in uh, a pandemic presents itself. Uh, so that's that's um, something that I, that I think is important. We need, I um, mean, our nursing work, home workers need um, as much morale uh, as they can possibly muster, and this would be a real boost to people's morale, and I think it would help nursing home workers and caregivers in our nursing homes fear, feel more valued and, uh, and better respected after the, the um, rancorous, uh, difficult labor negotiations that have been going on for some time. So what exactly, for people who don't know, is the federal top-off that Trudeau is proposing? Well, there's that, um, which is to bring wages up for those who don't make a, who make less than twenty five hundred dollars a month to twenty five hundred dollars. Um, but I was um, thinking more broadly um, that the province uh, should do that, uh, just as some grocery store chains have done for their workers, recognizing the particularly uh, difficult working conditions that um, caregivers and nursing homes. Uh, face right now. What has this pandemic taught us going forward about working conditions for, for some caregivers who have to work in two or three facilities just to pay their bills? Has this given us any insight into a different way that we should be doing things going forward? Yeah, I think that was a bit of a revelation for people to learn that um, many people working in nursing homes don't earn enough to uh, um, 
especially the ones who are, are not full-time permanent positions uh, to uh, make a living and, and work multiple jobs. Um, and that obviously uh, is an issue, particularly during a pandemic, but even at the best of times. Um, so that that's part of the concern. Um, but also we know that uh, working conditions are such that uh, there needs to be more paid time um, allocated for each resident in a nursing home. Uh, today, under normal conditions, the, um, the level of uh, the, the sort of the health um, status of nursing home residents is often much more challenging than in the past. And uh, so, so that needs to be recognized in terms of the amount of time um, that uh, is covered through provincial funding for care per patient. Obviously, our province has been successful compared to other provinces so far in keeping outbreaks out of nursing homes. Why do you think New Brunswick has been so successful so far, and what are your concerns going forward? Well, overall, I think we've been successful because we we uh, locked down early um, in the in the uh, uh, rate of spread in New Brunswick. Uh, we we uh, shut down and, and put in place social physical distancing and uh, and getting people to stay home um, and, sh and shutting down uh, public facing businesses that weren't essential very quickly uh, before before the um, community spread had taken a hold. And uh, so our community spread, it looks like is, <coughs> excuse me, it's very limited. And, um, and, and that puts us in a very fortunate place. And with limited community spread, obviously the chances of, of um, the virus spreading into nursing homes or long-term care homes is uh, significantly reduced. And add to that, and the measures that the province has implemented, um, for example, you know, looking at what's happened elsewhere uh, with nursing homes and long-term care homes, the province has been able to implement quite a few measures to try and avoid uh, what's happened in Quebec uh, and Ontario, BC, for example. One of the things that the province has done, which I think is really good, is um, the way we've restructured uh, decision making during for this pandemic is taking down a lot of the government has taken down a lot of the silos. So, with the pandemic task force of uh, three physicians, who include Dr. Russell and uh, the Deputy Minister of Health, they now are basically the umbrella decision makers over all aspects um, of the system, including nursing homes, uh, community care and homes, um, group homes and so on, as well as hospitals and uh, extramural and, su and such. So, so all of that is gathered under um, the t pandemic task force. And so no one, none of those parts of our system are, are uh, on the outside where before people will know that the nursing homes fell under social development, um, and there was quite a, a wall between between uh, nursing homes and uh, and the healthcare system as a result. Do you think we will restructure the way we run nursing homes after this is over? What do you think will change? Well, that's a good question. Um, with respect to nursing homes, I'm I'm not sure um, what it means in terms of future structuring. I think. Generally, across government, um, it, government will be very different. Uh, be very, uh, will be restructured. I think we've seen across government uh, the uh, the removal of silos, the tearing down of walls between departments, and the effectiveness of um, how that the effect the effectiveness of doing that, which is um, uh, evident in uh, how quickly decisions are getting made uh, on in so many ways on so many fronts. Uh, to put in place uh, so many initiatives that are are desperately needed in the case, in the in the face of a, a pandemic like we're uh, in the midst of now, so uh, we are going to see restructuring. Uh, the restructurings happen necessarily in the, in the context of the pandemic, and, and we'll see that restructuring uh, in some way permanently um, represented in the way government um, comes back up uh, as people are brought back into the uh, into into their offices and, uh, and departments. So um, how that will play out for nursing homes, um, I'm not sure yet, it's too early to say. 
Another issue that you are concerned with is the need for a year-round ferry to Camp Bello. Can you tell me a little bit about the petition you just brought forth um, to legislature? Yeah, well, um, um, Dale Calder brought uh, a petition to me uh, that he had been uh, circulating on the island. And uh, when we were in the Legislative Assembly briefly on on uh, last week, uh, I because we weren't doing routine business, we were just doing working on the bills, but I asked both the uh, speaker and the government house leader if they would be uh, uh, open to me to presenting this petition because it was a pressing matter. There's uh, significant numbers of people on, on Campobello who are feeling quite trapped um, and worried about what might happen at the border, um, uh, obviously in the middle of this pandemic. And so um, they said yes, and I was able to present the petition uh, in the Legislative Assembly calling for a, uh, a year-round permanent connection to the mainland uh, to enable New Brunswickers to move back and forth um, between the mainland and Campobello Island uh, within Canada. We've heard from the Premier that he's at least considering starting the Campobello summer ferry early. Do you know anything about this? Have you heard anything? All I know is there have been discussions uh, taken, that have taken place to try and get the summer ferry started up uh, sooner. Uh, that's for sure. But uh, as I've said, um, in, under the current situation, I think that the federal government would be very open to providing financial support uh, to help get a, a year-round ferry up and running, and uh, that would be um, that would be tremendous, a real game changer, I think, for for New Brunswick to have the the, the last island of the all the islands in New Brunswick to be finally connected year-round uh, to the mainland and and uh, vice versa. Um, you know, every other island is connected in our uh, transportation system. The, our ferries are part of our transportation system, and uh, they're treated the same way as roads by the provincial government, whether you're on Deer Island or Grand Manan, uh, or in the case of Miss School Island, which has a bridge now, um, and Lamech, uh, they're all connected uh, to the part province. They're all part of the province through a being part of the transportation system provincially, Campobello is the uh, sole exception, and that needs to change. Can we speak a little bit about food sustainability in New Brunswick? What are you pushing for in terms of making our province more sustainable in, in that regard? Well, I think everyone uh, sees that, well, before this happened, there is a strong appetite among New Brunswickers to be more self-sufficient in food. Um, and now, with the supply lines uh, for food, particularly some processed food and some um, um, fresh food uh, in question, um, particularly those from the United States, that I think has caused uh, people even more so to see the need to be more food self-sufficient in New Brunswick. So what... Um, what uh, what we presented uh, with the assistance of my my MLA colleague uh, Kevin Arsno, who uh, who's he and his uh, wife uh, and others a farm uh, up in uh, the Rogersville area, uh, put together a series of recommendations to um, help support small and medium-sized farmers um, in the current situation, and um, which would include some government led programs to enable them to increase their production um, and uh, obviously from there you also want to see um, and this will take a little bit longer but you want to see land that's currently fallow uh, coming into production and, and supporting uh, people who want to uh, move into farming uh, who haven't been farming in the past on that uh, land that has been laying fallow so uh, there's all kinds of opportunities um, we just need to put in place the proper programs and I'm pleased that the Premier has really gotten behind this and has uh, said uh, that food self-sufficiency has got to be uh, a significant element of the economic reconstruction uh, program that will was being put in place and uh, has called on the Department of Agriculture to bring forth a plan of concrete targets and timelines and, and recommendations for programs that need to be supported to support farmers. Premier Higgs has talked a lot about the collaborative effort of all the party leaders in New Brunswick on the pandemic task force. Um, what are your words on that? Has it been a great collaborative experience so far? 
yes, it has been very collaborative, but it's worked very well. Uh, I commend the premier on his foresight uh, and imagination to to um, bring together all the party leaders into a cabinet committee. No one else has done that in Canada, to my knowledge, and uh, it's it's I think only assisted uh, the um, the good good fortune we find ourselves in uh, in terms of uh, ensuring that what needs to be done happened and that uh, we uh, had uh, everyone's um, input from uh, all the political parties through the leaders uh, into uh, decisions that were taken and, and, uh, and programs that have been brought forward so that uh, you know we had a full court press uh, from all elected leaders participating in uh, helping to support the uh, response to the pandemic. As a leader of the New Brunswick Green Party, is there some silver lining to this whole pandemic in that it's made us realize our impact on the planet in terms of there being less uh, less pollution with cars being not driven as much? Um, and we've realized how connected we are to the earth and to each other. What are, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think um, one of the lessons perhaps is that we had have come to depend on uh, supply lines that are so long and complicated uh, that it creates for a, a, a brittle, uh, brittle society, and uh, for for essential products um, and and goods like well, obviously medical supplies, but food too. Um, one could make a list, I guess, that uh, we need to go um, move forward to. Uh, build more local production, support more local production uh, to meet local markets in the Maritimes uh, in our region. And uh, that, uh, I think that that will be a lesson that will hold over and we'll, we will see that. Um, in the past, certainly New Brunswick has been much more self-sufficient, has produced a lot more locally. Um, and uh, among the Maritime provinces, actually, people might be surprised to know, but we, produ we, we consume less of, of what we produce locally uh, than uh, is the case in either Nova Scotia or Prince Edward Island. Um, so we, we can uh, do much more actually to increase our uh, economic self-sufficiency. Thank you for joining me today, Mr. Kuhn. It's always a pleasure. Nice speaking with you. Have a good day. That was David Kuhn, leader of New Brunswick's Green Party. My next guest is Lori Nichols, CEO of Second Harvest, the largest food rescue organization in Canada and one of the global leaders when it comes to food recovery. The organization works across the supply chain from farm to retail to capture surplus food before it ends up in the landfill, diverting it to the tables of those in need across the country. Second Harvest is currently scaling up its foodrescue.ca program and thanks to a generous contribution from the federal government, FoodRescue.ca will be granting over $4 million in emergency funding to help ensure food makes its way as quickly as possible to Canadians who need it the most during the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'm just going to get started, Lori. Um, tell me about Second Harvest. First of all, what is it as an organization? Second Harvest is Canada's largest food recovery organization. And essentially that means we capture surplus food from across the supply chain primarily perishable food, all that great produce, dairy, and protein, before it puts into landfill. And we do that because food in landfill creates methane gas, and we're an environmental organization. And we also know that there are people that need food. And so we are also providing hunger relief. Can you tell me about the food rescue um, project that you're working on right now? Yeah, absolutely. So foodrescue.ca uh, was created a couple years ago. Foodrescue.ca was really a conduit for local organizations to provide food to their local communities. So it's very much like a eHarmony of food. You just, uh, you, you go on it if you're a local business, uh, but we have many national partners like Starbucks and, and blah, blahs and Walmart and whatnot. Um, and you go on it and you say, this is what I have available. And uh, a little uh, notification goes out to the community at like a certain radius and whoever wants it, gets it. And they say, I'll take it. And then they go pick it up. Like, it's really simple. So is it something that works across the country? When you say communities, it, it can be taken anywhere? Any community. It is national in scope and any, any community can use it because there really is no food that is too big or too small and it doesn't matter, right? So 
like for example, a Starbucks might not have a lot of food. Maybe it's like two or three sandwiches one day. And that might not seem like a lot, but it sure is a lot to some youth that's couch surfing. So, and then there might be a farm that has a crop. And so we try to figure out on the back end, how do we move that across, across the country? So if it was a, say a smaller mom and pa type restaurant, they could be involved as well. And then how would they get involved? They would go to foodrescue.ca and they would register like all of our businesses and all of our agencies. They'd have to comply with our health and safety regulations. Um, and then that's it, it's that simple. And then what about if you're on more the receiving side, if you wanted to access food from it, does it work in a similar way? Exactly the same way. So if you go to the website too, there's a lot of training videos that will show you exactly the steps that you need to take to uh, register. We also have a, a, a staff line. So if you're having a problem with it, then you can just call and someone will be able to help you. But it really is as simple as signing up, registering, uh, complying with our terms and conditions. So, you know, health and safety is paramount for all kind of food distribution because we don't want to make anybody sick. And so we won't. So you have to guarantee that if you're using, uh, if you're going to be supporting people with perishable food, that you understand the temperature control that's required and meet those kind of guidelines. Can you talk a little bit about the environmental aspect of it and how it sort of deals with food waste and how much food waste there actually normally is in a community? Absolutely. There is so much. So a couple of years ago, Second Harvest did some research and it was a world first research in identifying the amount of food that is lost and wasted in Canada. And we learned that 58%, more than half of the food produced for Canadians is lost or wasted across the supply chain. And that could be anywhere across the supply chain, but it usually is further up the supply chain where manufacturing and producing happens because they're just huge amounts of food. So if there's 58% of food that is being lost and wasted and a whole lot of that is edible, why aren't we eating it? And that was the impetus of, okay, so now we know we have this significant problem. We know that when food goes into landfill, it creates methane gas. Methane gas is a direct contributor to climate change. Uh, if food loss and waste were a country in terms of the methane gas it produced, it would be third, it would be second to the US and China, and that's it. Food waste is like huge, ecologically damaging our country and the world. And we know that there's more than enough food in the world to feed everybody. Like hunger doesn't need to exist. This is a systems problem. So we want to make sure that everybody can have this food and we're barrier free. Like there's no membership, you know, you have to register and make sure you're safe. But other than that, if you're a charity or a nonprofit, just sign up because we also did a mapping last year uh, that we were going to announce and then COVID happened. So it was actually great that we've done it because it's been, exceptionally helpful to us and we're working with uh, the government of Canada and giving them all this information and what we did was we mapped out where across Canada and how many charities and nonprofits are using food in their programming and it's over 60,000 so I think a lot of people don't even realize they think automatically food food bank and that's great and that serves a purpose but there's like that's less than a tenth of the places that people are accessing food, right? Like there's shelters, there's churches, there's Meals on Wheels, there's there's so many other places. So we want to make sure that if there's all that food, that it can find a home. And we can do that through foodrescue.ca. Can you speak a little to that? Because I think oftentimes people think of food banks as being the place you go and more of that handout idea. But what kind of organizations do you provide food to? It, that's the beauty of it. It really doesn't matter. So school programs like are universal access. And so, you know, you don't, you shouldn't have to put up your hand and say I'm poor. And I can say that because I was low income. So I love universal programming because it feels fair to everybody. And it's just, there's food. So let's not make it about being poor. Yeah. There's food, let's eat it. How has, has the demand dealing with the COVID-19 climate that we're all in, have you seen demand shift in a different way? Absolutely. Because of COVID and the social distancing, the way that we're providing food uh, in community is very different. Um, so it's like building hampers and community food programs that would, you know, congregate over dinners means, you know, we're making meals uh, in a different way. And 
we've lost a lot of volunteers. So even Meals on Wheels is struggling. Uh, how are we getting that food into isolated uh, areas or not isolated areas, just isolated seniors? So yes, there's been an absolute pivot on how we manage food uh, during the age of COVID-19. On the one hand, there's more need and there's actually less places that are offering the support. And on the other hand, the amount of perishable food that is available right now is astronomical. There is a huge spike because of the food service industry right. not having access, like unfortunately being really hurt by the whole COVID-19. Uh, there's a huge amount of food that's that needs a home. And it's and it's food that needs to be reprocessed or repackaged because it's it's things like 2,500 pound bags of potatoes. Well, you can't give that to family. You got to figure out how to manage that or, or you know, jugs and huge jugs of sour cream because it's, it was intended for food service, which makes sense. But as food service transition and pivots to grocery, uh, we have to figure out how to manage that food and, and make sure it doesn't go in the landfill. Um, what would be examples of surpluses that everyone from Loblaws to Starbucks to a small restaurant might have and might donate? They probably wouldn't have surplus because they're like grocery stores are being accessed by a whole lot of people. So that actually I think is an area where you're going to see a lot less right now. Where you're going to see it is in processing, manufacturing, distribution, probably uh, cold storages and producers, right? So. And also like, yeah, there's storage. There's a whole lot of potatoes that need homes. And so we're finding homes for them. But but you've heard about the milk that's being dumped. You know, we have a really good uh, farm, farming uh, system in Canada. And so we do produce a fair amount of food. So at the local level, at the grocery store, I would say not so much. At the restaurant level, well, they're, unfortunately they're closing. So it's really inside of that supply chain in different places. What has doing this project and being a part of this organization taught you about food supply, even in a place like Canada? Well, you know, I'll be honest, my background is food security. And so I didn't even realize that, that you're, I didn't understand the connection between food loss and waste and environment until I started working here. And I'm not unique. So I, we work with the World Bank. We work internationally in a lot of things. And they didn't make the connection between climate and food waste until a few years ago either. So I think that's good for all of us to know that there is a definite connection um, and that we're not so siloed. So that collaboration and working together is critical for us to you know, tackle these kind of huge problems. What word you, would you like to get out to organizations and people who might need to use this type of a service? Um, in order to reach more people to, to spread the contacts that are a part of it. I would just like, if you're a charity or a nonprofit and you need food and, and all of you pretty much do because we all use food in our programming, uh, join foodrescue.ca. You'll you never know what's going on that thing either. Like it's been fascinating. Last week was uh, Air Canada and Sunwing because they had all this extra. So I wouldn't have thought necessarily plain food, but yeah it went through it so so and it's great and there's a whole lot of it and and the beauty of it was actually individually packaged sizes which is exactly what we need right now so uh and if you're a food business of any kind go on it you know you know you have surplus sometimes and if you can't do it every week then do it every month so there there's people that need your food and you don't want it to go in landfill either so save yourself on some tipping fees that was Lori Nichols, CEO of Second Harvest. I'm Vicki Hogarth. Thank you for joining me today. I'll see you next time on Southwest Magazine. Southwest Magazine is a news and public affairs production of CHCO-TV, New Brunswick's only source for independent community television.